Good morning, everybody. Well, I want to introduce my special guest today. I talked about it a little uh, last week. I was approached um, a month or two ago by the New York State Department of Health, who had just came out with the new, um, what is the what is the official, it's the Fish Consumption Advisory yep, the Guide. State, yep, the, the, the New York State Department of Health, Health Advice on Eating Fish You Catch. On Eating Fish You Catch, and this, I'm going to introduce you real quick. This is my new friend, Audrey. Audrey, tell everybody who, what you do. Sure. I'm a public health specialist with the New York State Department of Health, and I run the Fish Advisory Outreach Program for New York State. So as, so I asked you this the other day when we had a conference call. So you work directly with the DEC? We do work directly with the DEC. DEC collects all the fish. Uh, they do the lab work and the, the sampling that is involved in that, and then they provide the data uh, straight to New York State Department of Health. Our toxicologists review the data, and they're the ones that set the advice. Awesome. Now, how often is this updated? Is it yearly? It's yearly. It yeah. is yearly. Yeah, and depending on where DEC is sampling, um, you know, they, they do over a thousand samples a year of fish, and so we get data all throughout the year. We tend to update it once in the spring. Uh, for the for the season. Okay. Now, do you find year to year that there are a lot of changes, a lot of differences, or does it stay pretty static? Or yeah. So typically, um, there's just like a handful of little changes per year. Um, in 2020, we updated our PCB guidelines, and this past year, we made major changes to the statewide uh, mercury advisory. So this year, there are a lot of changes. And if you haven't looked up your advisory, you probably should. And those are our those are our big two, mercury and PCBs. Correct. That's what we deal with mostly when we talk about contamination in fish of any sort. That's right. Yeah, those are the two the two most prominent ones in New York State. Now, predominantly now people watch my my channel all over the country, but we have a pretty hardcore core audience here in Central New York that fish in Nida Lake. And and one of the things that I was so pleased to hear was how Nida it ranks it, it very near the top of the best waters in New York State to eat your catch out of. Correct. Um, and I was very pleased to hear that, and that speaks volumes for our lake. So our predominant eating species in this lake, and, and people can, can eat anything, but our walleye and perch, I would safely say that those are our two biggest sought after um, species. Does it change at all between the two as far as the recommendations of how many walleye you could eat as opposed to how many perch? Are they kind of one and the same? Um, so typically in other waters, uh, walleye can be pretty contaminated with mercury, especially the larger walleye. Um, perch, uh, some of the larger perch uh, are what we call 4-1, so four meals per month for the general population, one meal per month uh, for the sensitive population, for the larger ones, four meals a month for everybody for the, for the smaller perch. Um, walleye are actually, I don't eat in a lot of waters for the for the fish that are larger than 19 inches. Um, in Oneida, luckily that's not the case. Uh, the sensitive population can eat more. I believe it's 4-1 uh, for, for walleye from Oneida. So that's really good. That means that the bigger walleye are still very low in mercury. And real quick, sensitive is? Yeah, so sensitive population, anybody who can get pregnant um, and children under 50. Children under 15, and okay. The general population is typically um, everybody else, you know, men, women over 50-ish, uh, anyone who's not going to be getting pregnant. Gotcha. Today, as we're talking about this, um, but we're also out here on the water, and we're going to go do a little fishing. So, with any luck, we're going to catch a couple walleyes, we're going to take them back to the house, I'll fillet them, we'll talk about filleting process, skinning. So... Audrey told me something fascinating on the way out in our conversation, and that is by skinning and trimming your fillets, you can cut your PCB levels. PCB level because that's in the fat. Yeah. Um, in half. Yeah. That that's huge. And 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 I the first thing I said is well, most people I know are are trimming that skin, are removing the skin. They might not trim the fat out, the discolored meat, um, but they're certainly at least trimming the fat or the the skin off it so that's a start that's a start um, yeah and cooking it so the fat drips off and you said pan frying and deep frying are, are probably not the greatest cooking methods although 
for for other health reasons there as well <laughs> you know so and, and of those maybe you have one meal a month of of fish fries so um all right well we're gonna go see if we can catch a few fish we're out here we're gonna jig we're gonna pull some harnesses and we're gonna see if we can get hooked up and then go do a little uh do a little fish fry stay tuned thank you so much for being with me today absolutely talk to you guys soon all right we're back we got some trolling rods out we're, we're still aiming to catch a fish. We've had a couple on, um, but we have not successfully landed one yet. But the day is still young. We're having some fantastic conversation here, and I wanted to make sure that we got it to where everybody could listen in. So we got the rods out. So let's, let's continue our conversation. We're talking about the fish advisory for consumption on different bodies of water. We've talked specifically about Ignita because that's where we are. Um, but here in central New York, we have the Finger Lakes, we have the St. Lawrence River, we have Lake Ontario, all amazing fisheries. Um, let's talk a little bit, let's start with the Finger Lakes. Let's talk a little bit about the Finger Lakes. and. So with the Finger Lakes, I mean, there's obviously tons of choices. You guys have all these great lakes, wonderful water quality, great fishing. Um, for the most part, it's a, it's a good story. Uh, there are a few lakes that do have specific advisories due to mercury. Um, some of it is perch, some of it might be rainbow trout. Um, Owasco Lake is one of them, Cuca Lake, uh, Seneca Lake. And you can find that info on our website for your specific uh, lake that you're trying to fish on. It's www.health.ny.gov slash fish. And I'll have the link in the description <laughs> below, just so you know. And some of that is just a matter of, uh, you know, size for these fish. They, they have these massive lakes that they're getting, they're getting larger. Um, mercury is oftentimes associated with, with larger, bigger fish. So if you are out fishing, it's always good to try to keep uh, smaller fish within regulation size. It'll just have less mercury. But for the most part, Finger Lakes is excellent fishing. There's very few issues. Obviously, there are some issues with Onondaga Lake. Um, for the sensitive population, nobody should be eating fish uh, from Onondaga Lake. General population can actually eat some fish, um, but they are, you know, that's an ongoing cleanup. They're doing what they can. Uh, do, you, do you think, and I, I don't want to get off topic or, or but again, as a central New York kid, I, I grew up at Onondaga Lake and, and Long Branch Park and all that stuff, and it's, it's right in the heart of our city, but is there ever a chance where that's going to, like how long would we really be talking about before that comes back to a semi-natural state? I mean, could it ever happen with, with everything that would happen back during in the 40s when they dumped stuff there from Salve Process and all that stuff? Will we ever see an Onondaga Lake that's, that's clean, restriction-free? I mean, it definitely can happen. They're doing a lot of work to make it happen. There's a lot of agencies. There's a lot of people involved. Um, you know, there are some fish that can be eaten now, like I said, from the general population. Uh, yellow perch is, is one of them. Um, some of these things do just take time. Time. Yeah. Time. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And we're not even at 100 years since most of that damage was done. Yeah. So, um, but but moving on and, and, and really part of the, the biggest thing we've talked about all day is, like you just said, within the structure of the limit and the size limits, if you're looking to eat fish, you want those smaller fish. Those smaller fish are generally a better choice. Yep. So walleye is 19 inches or less. Perch, you said, was 10 inches or less. Yep. Um, over that, in those species, you start to see an exponential increase, which is what's causing that to be the line in the sand. Correct. So I, on our lake, you know, and everybody, it's funny, on our lake, most everybody would throw something back if it was less than 10 inches for a perch, if you're perch fishing, because you want those big ones. Yeah. You know, if we're going to eat them, we don't want the big ones. <laughs> I guess that's really the point. And, and that's for any of our species in this state, any species that is talked about directly in the, in the advisory is you're doing yourself a disservice to eat those big ones. And in the, in the new statewide advisory, so previously on most of our waters, there was just general advice, which was four meals a month, 
for for everything for everyone in the family for all the fish um new york state department of health went through a process where we updated our mercury guidelines and that was to be more protective in some cases and also in recognition that we were being overly protective in other cases especially for women and children for the sensitive population um, so a lot of waters that used to have advisories are now um, you know women and children can eat some fish from those waters just choosing lower mercury species um, so any water that doesn't have a specific advisory the new statewide advice applies and that's fish specific advice um, and that's for areas outside of the Adirondacks and Catskills. And the Adirondacks and Catskills are still a hot spot let's call it. Yeah they're still impacted by mercury. Okay yeah. so we talked on the way out this morning off camera you know I remember as a kid here in central New York in the 70s and 80s always heard about acid rain up in the mountains. Um, Let's talk a little about that because the first thing you said to me is the the DEC is still actively working to to counteract some of those some of those things. What are they What are they doing up in the Adirondacks for water quality and for fish quality? Yeah, I mean, so part of it is just continuing to have pretty strict environmental regulations. Um, a lot of the mercury does come still from from human sources. Some of it is naturally occurring, so some of it is in our soils. Uh, mercury can be released from things like volcanoes and forest fires, um, but you know coal coal burning uh, still releases mercury, and actually gold mining in some other parts of the world is is a big producer of of atmospheric mercury. Hmm. So the same rain falls across all of New York State, but certain areas, especially like the Adirondacks and the Catskills, the the waters are more susceptible to it. The the biology the the geology is is such that um, that mercury really builds up in the fish there. So um, as far as I know, DEC continues to lime uh, lakes in the Adirondacks to attempt to correct some of those pH issues um, that you know are still an issue in, in that area. Besides fish, are there other food sources that humans would eat that would contain mercury that we could get mercury contamination from? Like we do with with eating fish. I feel like seafood is really all seafood. It, it's really fish, primarily shellfish. Seafood. Yeah, shellfish tends to be lower. It's really I think it's mostly uh, fin fish. Um, fin fish, okay. Yeah. We're we're being surrounded by these little bugs. They don't bite or nothing, but they want to crawl in my nose and up my eye. And <laughs> so if you see us all going like this, that's why. Don't don't be alarmed. Uh, so one of the questions we we know that fish is part of a healthy diet. We know that. In a normal food pyramid, that fish is a big part of a healthy diet. How does that play into what the health department does while working with DEC to come up with a way to protect us, but yet empower us to know what we're what we're eating? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, fish continue to be a great source of protein, right? They have super healthy fats, omega threes. Um, even just the act of fishing, right? Being outside, being away from a screen, getting kids out, mm -hmm. uh, enjoying our beautiful waters and our parks uh, is a huge mental health benefit uh, for so many folks. So, you know, DOH does consider this. We, we do not just use uh, a straight guideline to set fish advisories. We take a risk management approach and we try to consider um, making sure that that people can still enjoy the resource within these guidelines and try to make them, um, you know, useful and, and, and provide info to people about how many fish meals per month uh, makes sense. And if you eat a lot of fish, then, you know, you probably should closely follow the advisories. If you're only eating fish a couple times a year, then, you know, it, it's much less of a concern. Right. Um, ultimately, you know, it's still going to be better than, than fast food or something. Absolutely. Um, you know, and we, we do try, I mean, some, some places though, it is a negative message, right? There are places in New York state that have contamination issues and it is pretty restrictive. Um, you know, the Hudson River, people still, you know, sensitive population shouldn't eat any fish from, from the Hudson River. Onondaga. And that, uh, how far, the Hudson River is a big river. Big river. I, I'm not intimately familiar with yeah. the Hudson River, but I know that it stretches a long way. Are those advisories of the Hudson for its entirety? 
or does it only go to certain areas of the Hudson? Yeah, so there's a there's a section in the Adirondacks that uh, people can just follow the Adirondack advisory. It's very clean up there um, from essentially Washington County, Saratoga County, so um, Hudson Falls, okay, um, all the way down to the New York City Battery is considered the Superfund site. Gotcha. Um, and there is a stretch between um, Hudson Falls and Troy where it's actually catch and release only. Um, it's take no fish, eat no fish. So you can actually get fined if you take fish. And that, that's essentially a, a health protective measure that was put into place because of levels of PCBs. Really? Yeah. And that's from industry in the area? That's from industry. In that, in that particular situation? Yeah. We, we talked a little bit about Onondaga yeah. earlier. That was from industry yeah. back a long time ago. Yeah. Um, do we have other hot spots like that in the in the state? I mean, are those your two big? Everybody knows about Onondaga and the Hudson. Everybody knows about Onondaga and the Hudson. I mean, there's a handful of of other spots, but they tend to be um, sort of more contained. You know, they're they're smaller. They're 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 not as widespread as as those bodies of water. Okay. And I mean, one of the questions that you know, we spend a lot of time answering for people is, okay, so if I can't eat the fish from my body of water, which is, you know, near my house or whatever, where can I eat the fish? Um, so the health department has tried to do quite a bit of outreach around this. Uh, we have created county-based maps that are color coded and show which advisories apply to what public access waters. Uh, we're not entirely done this project, but we have most of the Hudson Valley mapped as well as, you know, we're starting to move westward um, so those maps are really useful they're great for families just starting off fishing because it just points them to waters that where there is public access okay. and it gives people peace of mind that you know um, our advisories apply to tributaries as well up to the first impassable barrier okay because the fish you know the chemicals stay in the fish and the fish can swim up until sure. the dam or waterfall sure. um, and so sometimes it can be a little bit tricky uh, for anglers to figure out like well what advisory applies to where i'm fishing right now and so these maps are an effort to try to to do some of the work for the angler and make it really clear what advice they should follow we were when we came out earlier we were talking about the mayfly hatch on this lake and, mm -hmm. and how prolific it is and you said to me something interesting that that might be a contributing factor to why these the fish in this particular lake um, are better eating because they're supplementing their diet for big parts of the season on insects. And you said insects, as opposed to other forage fish, are less contaminated. And so I found that pretty interesting. What do we have any? Have we ever thought about that on a larger scale before? I don't know. I mean, that's that's a good question for one of our, our fisheries students to, to do some research on. You know. Our, our next one, we're gonna have we're gonna have another DC scientist sitting right here next to you. That's right. Yeah. Um, because these these kind of fascinating conversations are just that, and and I think everybody. You don't have to be a fisherman, you, you know. A lot of a lot of fishermen will will keep their fish if they have a good day, and and might if they have an abundance, might give it to a neighbor or something, and and um, so you don't have to be a fisherman to care about what fish I can eat. Is my water clean? You know, I, I think water clarity, you can't have good fish to eat out of a cruddy body of water. And and water quality is huge. And um, I think everybody should be concerned about that. Even if you think, oh, you know, I don't eat that much fish. No, great. But all the rest of the things environmentally that we're talking about do affect us. Mm -hmm. You know, we live here, we're humans, and, and we need to make sure that we understand what we're doing to our own environment and what we can take from it still. Yep. Um, does, this is a little tiny bit off topic, but is there any kind of other consumption advisories that the health department does outside of fish? Um, so there are some advisories for things like snapping turtles. So if the body of water that you're- <laughs> For eating snapping for turtles. For eating snapping turtles, yeah. So if there are PCBs in that water, we recommend not eating because they're also very fatty and it'll the PCBs really build up in the fat of fish. Um, there are some waterfowl advisories as well, um, okay. especially up like on the northern part of the Hudson where it's really contaminated with PCBs. 
um, some of the, the the fattier species are you know we, we recommend not to eat hmm. um, for the most part like our other game species are, are really pretty good choices okay um, but yeah so that makes sense that's fascinating and, and I mean like if you're in Long Island or something obviously follow the shellfish closures right <laughs> like don't be don't be shell fishing from from closed areas because that's just now what, that's gambling there <laughs> and, and again uh i'll i'll err on the side of not many people that are watching me up here know anything about the ocean so what would what would cause something like that in advisory for shellfish um yeah, so I mean, sometimes there are things like red tides that happen. So, um, and the red tide is algae based. Algae based, yep. Uh, oftentimes, the closures may come from uh, combined sewer overflow. So, if the water quality gets bad and there's too much bacteria in in the water, that's a concern because you know people are, are eating them, can be eating them raw. Um, all oh, right yeah right. oysters and stuff sure. yeah sure yeah so uh you know that's why they're they're monitored really closely um those those shell fishing areas in long island so dec maintains that information now i'll speak about this lake we get a blue green algae uh, bloom multiple times a year that can be pretty gnarly i mean it, it'll be it'll be like pea soup out here yeah in the short immediate does that play any effect in and should we or should we not eat fish caught during those periods? Yeah, I mean, the, the guidance is if, if you see it, you should just avoid it. Um, you should try to avoid fishing in it and you, you should probably not eat it because uh, it's, it's hard to tell whether like the, the microcystin is actually in the algal, algal bloom. Sometimes there is and sometimes there's not. Um, so the best thing is to avoid it. Um, part of it is also contact, contact with the water as like you're bringing the fish in and stuff. Um, definitely keep your dogs <laughs> away from the yeah, water. Yeah, I've time. heard that with 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 dogs. Um, I never thought about that until you just said about the red tide. <laughs> so there's there's another interesting part. We'll have to add that to the advisory. Yeah, we have um, we have like a really nice website on the blue green algae stuff that I can I can give you the link for too. Awesome, we'll put that in there as well because everybody knows this lake this lake gets it big time. Um, and I don't know the, the science of it, and I know that there's a certain point of water temperature that really triggers it, um, but that is that is something that we do deal with mm -hmm. multiple times a year on this lake. Yeah. Um, and I never really thought of it, but that makes sense that we would, they tell you not to swim in it because and, and, you may ingest a little bit of it. Yeah. So I would assume the fish that we come in contact with have lived in it, they would be affected as well. Um, and that would only be during the bloom, you think? Usually that's what they say, yes. Hmm, interesting. DEC and DOH have like a collaborative program for blue-green algae. Um, so they do test some of the water, but I don't know that it's every bloom every time. Is that pretty widespread throughout the state? Yeah, yeah, yeah there's, a lot of, there's a lot of communities that are struggling with, with blue-green al algal blooms for sure. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Perch fry have hatched, yeah. and so you'll see clouds of them on the oh, surface. Cool. But these walleyes are, are puking them up, yeah, um, big this time. Is just so full, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I get the impression they're down there like a whale filter feeding, you know, yeah. and they're just <laughs> yep. going through them because I can't imagine they would expend the energy to bite, you know, oh. one individually at a time. Yeah, they're, they're most of them aren't even an inch long. There's a put and take fisher. You know, it's the hatcheries right over there yeah. on that shoreline. Um, and everybody in this area has grown up eating walleye. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that's I that's one of the reasons I thought this would be so cool is to have people understand A, feel better about yeah. their lake and their fish, inform them. Um, I think that's all pretty cool stuff. Oh, <sighs> All right, we caught a fish today. Now we're going to cut them and we're going to clean them. So in everything we've been talking about, one of the main things that Audrey has said repeatedly is to have a smaller fish to clean your fish properly. 
of the things that Audrey said earlier that that means is skinning them, taking any dark colored meat off. Now, I can tell you right now that this fish is a little underweight because there is not much of a fillet coming off this. It's just not much meat on it. But that won't stop us from what we're doing. So most of the time with your walleyes, you don't get much discoloration. You get that little bit of discoloration in the lateral line. Now we can shave that out. So there's that discolored, discolored meat right there. Now that alone, that's your fat and that's your bloodline. So this is where the PCBs would be held in the fat, correct? Yeah. And if you have like a bigger fish, like a lake trout or something, I want the back and the belly. The back and the belly, okay. Yeah. All right, everybody, let's wrap things up today with a bite of fish. Cheers. Cheers. Fresh walleye. Doesn't get any fresher than that. It was swimming 20 minutes ago. Hmm. That is good. Nice and light, flaky. You can see we took the, um, I took the lateral line out of it. Not that there's a ton of fat on a walleye like this, not like a trout or something that lives in deep cold mm -hmm. water. Um, but skin it, take what little discoloration is on the back side of the fillet off, and you cut your PCB intake in half, right yep. off the bat. Um, and cook it so the, so the fat drips off. Which, which we didn't, but this is our one meal a month, so we're, all, we're okay. I just did it in a pan with a little bit of oil in the bottom of the pan. Normally you would want to cook it with the skin off so that fat can drain yeah. away from the flesh. You can broil, bake, grill it. Yeah. So get out there, catch some fish. Now you know what you can eat, how much you can eat, where you can eat it from. And if you want more information on that, check in the description below and I'll have the website links for the maps for all the for all of New York State. Yep. Audrey, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. And thanks for, for getting day. the word out. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed it. And as always, when we get done, we do a little thing called keep your tip up. So okay. we just go like this. So on three, we'll do that. We'll okay. go one, two, three. Keep, keep your, your tip, tip up. up.